It's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening to this annual Bishop Fenwick Archbishop's Thank You Dinner. To begin the evening, I have asked Deacon David Carvajal Kozel of the Diocese of Tulsa to say our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for the countless blessings we have received this day. We thank you for the opportunity to spend this evening with our honored guests and benefactors. In a special way, we ask you to pour out your graces upon them. And we rejoice that by your mercy and through their generosity, we may continue to prepare to be sent out as your laborers in your field. We pray for all these and all those most in need of you today. And we give you thanks for this meal and for those who have prepared it as we pray. Bless us, O Lord, in these thy gifts which we are about to receive from that bounty through Christ our Lord. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Again, welcome everyone. I invite you to go ahead and enjoy the salads that are already set and I'll return to the podium in just a moment to begin our program. Ladies and gentlemen, as they're taking up your salad plates, I want to go ahead and again welcome you all here this evening for the Bishop Fenwick Society Appreciation Dinner. In particular, I want to extend our warm welcome to Helvin Alvare of the George Mason University's Antonin Scalia Law School, who will be speaking to us this evening. I'm also honored to welcome His Excellency Archbishop Dennis Schnur, members of the Athenaeum of Ohio's Board of Trustees, our faculty and staff, and you, our honored guest, our members of the Bishop Fenwick Society, who are our great benefactors and supporters. I also want to recognize and give a special thanks to our sponsors, Fort Washington Investment Advisors, Fund Evaluation Group, Joseph Auto Group, Kramer and Feldman, Patriot Signage, Turner Construction, Verdon Company, Gate of Heaven Cemetery, USI Insurance, and Watson's Superstore. Thank you to all of them for helping make this evening possible. Tonight is our opportunity to say thank you to each of you, for all of you play a very important and special role in supporting this seminary. Through the leadership gifts, Bishop Fenwick Society annual support, St. Gregory Legacy Society gifts, your prayers, your service, all of that support of which we are the beneficiaries makes this great institution possible and keeps it open year after year. So. Thank you very much, and I want to recognize all of our benefactors here this evening. I want to say, that obviously, that it is not simply this great institution that draws us here this evening, but also the shared faith, the faith that the Lord has called us to, given us a gift of living in, but also given us the mission to send out into the world. And so this evening is also a celebration of the work that goes forth day after day in and through our parishes, which so many of you support, to make possible the preaching of the faith. This evening also gives us an opportunity to recognize the young men who have heard and answered the call from our Lord to serve as his priest in his holy church. The education and formation they receive in preparation to serve the people of God and, in fact, the world takes years and is not an inexpensive undertaking. So in recognizing them, I again recognize you, you who are in this room this evening, because it is your generosity along with others, others who cannot be here that makes it possible 
to send these men out to do the work to which the Lord has called them. And so I'm particularly honored to introduce to you the ordination class of 2019. In the next few weeks, 14 men, the largest number to be ordained from Mount St. Mary's Seminary in 37 years, will be ordained to the priesthood of Christ. So I would ask each of the deacons to stand when I call their name and remain standing. To be ordained for the Diocese of Louisville, Reverend Mr. Kirby Rust. For the Diocese of Kansas City, St. Joseph, Reverend Mr. Kendall Ketterlin. For the Diocese of Tulsa, Oklahoma, Reverend Mr. David Carval Kazel. And Reverend Mr. James Porter. For the Diocese of Youngstown and hailing from Slovakia, Reverend Mr. Simon Mino. And for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, hailing from Uganda, Reverend Mr. Alex Biramuyesho. <laughs> Reverend Mr. Mark Bredestegi. <laughs> Reverend Mr. Zachary Cecil. <laughs> Reverend Mr. Christian Cohn Lombarte. Reverend Mr. Ambrose DeBrosi. <laughs> Reverend Mr. Andrew Hess. Also hailing from Uganda, Reverend Mr. Elias Miswege. <laughs> Reverend Mr. Jeffrey Stegbauer. fans over here and family, <laughs> and Reverend Mr. Jedediah Tridel. <laughs> Thank you, gentlemen. <laughs> At Mount St. Mary's Seminary, we educate and form not only those men who are studying for the archdiocese, but also men from other dioceses whom their bishops have chosen our seminary because they recognize its quality of the programs and the goodness of the men there and the faculty and the support that they receive in this community. They know that it is a good place for their priests to be formed. We also recognize that at the Athenaeum of Ohio, we form men and women for the permanent diaconate as well as the lay ministry and that they go out into the community to serve the Catholic faith, to serve the Catholic people, those who are not of the faith, and they bring the light of Christ into the world day after day. And to do that in a way in which the faith is authentically and integrally presented, they need a place to train, a place to study, a place to be formed, and you make that possible. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lori Rosati, who this year began her work at the Athenaeum of Ohio Mount St. Mary's as the Vice President for Development and Relations. Dr. Rosati. Thank you, Father Anthony. Thank you all for joining us this evening. It's wonderful to see so many people so enthusiastic about the work that we're doing. Um, as Father Anthony mentioned, I'm fairly new to the Athenaeum. Actually, today is three months and three days. So, um, <laughs> but 
that wasn't supposed to be an applause line, but okay. Uh, um, I'm thrilled to be at the Athenaeum. As I, I've said for the last few months, it really gives me the opportunity to marry together my faith with development work, which I absolutely love, and with higher education. And so all those things come together beautifully at the Athenaeum with the work that we're doing. And so thank you all for how you're helping with that. And so with that, I'd like to share with you a video that explains a little bit more about how the impact of what you do by supporting the Bishop Fenwick Society makes a difference in the community for all of us. And so at this time, we're going to see a video about that. It's in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Did you have a good retreat? Uh -huh. All right, that's pretty cool. See you guys later. Have a good day. Life as a priest is intense. It is far busier than I ever thought it would be, far more demanding than I ever thought it would be. This is one of my favorite Gospels. And we're expected to be experts in so many different areas. Church's teachings on medical ethics, the whole Bible, and all of church history, and psychology, and, and relationships, all of these things. I was prepared for in the seminary. It's something that we studied. It's something that we worked on. It's something that we practiced. And the thing that I appreciate the most from my formation is the foundation in prayer, making the Eucharist, Jesus Christ in the Eucharist, the absolute center of my life. It was structured into the foundation of the life at Mount St. Mary's. The Catholic faith, and in particular this institution, instructs people, helps people live life at a deeper level that touches the heart, that touches the core of what it means to be in existence, to be called into existence by God, and what our meaning and our purpose is. Well, there's four dimensions to formation, the human, the intellectual, the spiritual, and the pastoral. And the Lord wants to make use of all four of those dimensions, the totality of the person, the whole person, uh, to bring the gospel to serve his people. This is my sixth year of seminary formation. But it gives you that time to truly form your interior life and your spiritual life, to really um, get grounded with the Lord in prayer and in the, in the scriptures and in looking at who I am and my strengths, my weaknesses, and how God is calling me um, through all of that. Good morning, everyone. You know, to be ordained a priest, you have to have, you know, such an extensive education in philosophy and theology. You know, it's a very well-rounded thing. You're looking at pastoral internship, you know, we go out into the parish and it gives you that hands-on experience in as much as it's possible <laughs> to really live the day-to-day -day life of a parish priest. The seminary is a formational community, and in many ways they're responsible for forming each other in the brotherhood, in the priesthood. And all these different dioceses and religious orders, they add really a great breadth to that and a, and a vitality. The universality of the work of the church is present here in a very concrete way. We also form men for the permanent diaconate and lay people for the various ministries in the church. And so the people that go out from here, they want to bring others into that depth of relationship with God. Hello. How are you? My formation at the uh, Antonym gave me the tools to be able to do what I do now. I'm an internist and also a permanent deacon. We get spiritual questions from time to time. We get lots of end of life decisions. You have to have that background, religious background. I do all the things that deacons do in the parish setting, uh, baptism ceremonies, wedding ceremonies, uh, funerals, physical healing uh, as a physician, spiritual healing as a deacon. My formation at the uh, Antonym gives me a broad basis to. Uh, do my best to help people. Again, he measured off a thousand. 
as the Director of Religious Education, I want to provide a resource for our teachers so that they can be excellent catechists and they can share their faith. But I love being able to share my faith with the kids as well. The Athenaeum teaches us everything that we need to know in order to do ministry in our church. I think I've had over 20 instructors now. It is amazing the base of knowledge that they have about our faith and how well they communicate it to us and teach us. Taking classes has done such great things for my own formation and being able to teach others about what I have learned. Formation, if it's done well, it's all those things that challenge you, but it also always has and never loses that sense of joy, the anticipation of the work, the joy of the work, and the joy of the fruits, because the Lord doesn't disappoint. If it's what you're called to, it is better than anything you could have imagined. Getting to be close to people um, and getting to, getting to serve them and really getting to bring Jesus Christ to them and to be the one who is the, the minister of that grace, of the mercy of Jesus Christ, there's nothing better. It is, it is amazing, it is amazing, and it gives me so much joy. So I just want to say once again, thank you all for everything that you do to support the work of the Athenaeum and the, the wonderful students and seminarians that we have there. Um, as you'll see, the entrees are being served. We'll come back a little bit uh, later at the end of dinner, the beginning of dessert, but enjoy the uh, evening. Thank you. It is now my pleasure It is now my pleasure to introduce the Archbishop of Cincinnati Archbishop Dennis Schnoor who will introduce our speaker this evening Archbishop Schnoor All right, thank you, Father Brausch, and to all of you this evening, thank you very much for being here. And, and, and you're here, and we're so privileged to have you here this evening because you do indeed make our seminary possible. Without you, the seminary would not exist. You have made it clear from your passionate, steadfast support and commit, of commitment to our faith that we can count on you, and we are extremely grateful. These are exciting times for the church in the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, and particularly for our seminary. Last month, I had the privilege of ordaining 15 permanent deacons and three transitional deacons for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. <laughs> this month, as Father Brausch has already mentioned, I will be ordaining nine men to the priesthood for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. And this fall, 17 new seminarians for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati will join the Archdiocese of Cincinnati, enter the seminary for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati. That will bring to a total for the Archdiocese of Cincinnati studying next year, uh, 64 seminarians. But as Father Anthony has already mentioned, we are also blessed at our seminary, Mount St. Mary's Seminary, to have seminarians from other dioceses and religious communities. Their presence enriches our seminary program but it also benefits our archdiocese because all of our seminarians, all the seminarians at Mount St. Mary's, they go into our parishes, they go into our schools, they go into our nursing homes, they go into our hospitals, and they provide spiritual comfort and companionship for the people who need it. And so 
to every one of our seminarians uh, that are in the room this evening, I want to extend personally a very deep uh, uh, expression of gratitude for the way in which you have enriched, you do enrich, and you continue to enrich the life of the church in this archdiocese. And of course, I want to thank Father Brausch, our president and rector of the Athenaeum and Mount St. Mary's Seminary for the hard work that he does in shepherding all of this. Uh, and not only shepherding the, the work of the, of the Athenaeum and the seminary, uh, but as you know, we have a construction project going on out there. And uh, Father Anthony has been very involved in that and has made certain that the construction people were right on target. <laughs> And finally, I want to thank, once again, our benefactors. I want to thank the faculty and staff of the, of the Athenaeum. And foremost, I want to thank God for blessing us and helping us to grow and leading us forward. So to all of you, thank you. Now this evening, I have the privilege of introducing a Dr. Professor Helen Elveray. Helen and I have known one another since 1989. Uh, I had the privilege of working with her for a number of years at the Bishop's Conference in, in Washington, D.C. When I arrived in, at the Bishop's Conference in 1989, Helen was working in the office of the General Council of the, of the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops, the National Conference, uh, the United States the United States Conference, uh, the United States Catholic Conference, and the National Conference of the Catholic Bishops. The, the, two have, the two have been combined, and I'm kind of uh, uh, used to this combined title and not that hyphenated title that we had in the past. But Helen was working in the office of the General Council, but then uh, in the early 90s, um, Cardinal O'Connor uh, was elected chair of the, the Pro-Life Committee and he was able to procure a very substantial donation from the Knights of Columbus to expand our pro-life office. And so one of the things that we wanted to do is to get a spokesperson for the pro-life position in the, of, the, of the Catholic Church, the pro-life position uh, in this country. And so I was working in the General Secretariat at the time, and so we put together the criteria for the individual that we wanted that we thought would be the ideal person to fill this position, the spokesperson for the pro-life position in the United States. And after we put all of these uh, criteria together, everybody kind of sat back and says, who are we gonna get? Who, who's gonna fulfill all of this? And I said, it's simple, we already have her. She's in the office of the general secretary. She just is the, uh, of the, she's in the office of the general counsel. We just have to move her over. And so I recommended Helen for that position and she was tremendously effective. As a matter of fact, our opponents wouldn't even appear on stage or in any press conference with Helen because Helen was just that articulate. <laughs> Helen obviously is very committed to the pro-life cause, but she's also committed to family. I remember when she was still working at the Bishop's Conference, I would go down to visit her office and Helen was very busy at her desk, but right ne next to her desk was a bisonette with a little child, or her children, and her little child, her newborn baby, right in, the, in her office with her. So Helen took care of her work, but she wasn't gonna let the family behind either. So uh, Helen is a very, very uh, uh, admirable person in that regard. Presently, Helen is a professor of law at the Antonin Scalia Law of School at, the, at, at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Helen teaches family law, law and religion, and property law, and publishes on matters concerning marriage, parenting, non-marital households, and First Amendment religion clauses. Formerly a consultant to the Pontifical Council of the Laity, she is now a member of the New Dicastery for Laity, Family, and Life for the Holy See. She is also a consultant and advisor to the USCCB, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops in Washington, D.C. She's a founder of Women Speak for Themselves, and she's also a news consultant for ABC News. Prior to joining the faculty at Scalia Law at, at George Mason, Professor 
Alvare taught at the, at the Columbus School of Law at the Catholic University of America. She received her bachelor's degree from Villanova University, her law degree from Cornell Univers University School of Law, and she also holds a master's degree in systematic theology from the Catholic University of America. Please join me in welcoming Professor Helen Alvare. Thank you so much. Thank you, Archbishop. And I also want to thank the rector, Father Brausch, for taking me in his truck from the airport to the seminary. And, <laughs> and I want to thank him for the country music on his phone. It reminds me of the old days. I, I, I am really, it's a pleasure to be with you here. I, I always love being with Archbishop Schnur. I can tell you, and, and even the little I've spoken to people here, I sense that my experience was not just mine, that when I worked at the Bishop's Conference for the Archbishop, he was so good at allowing people to be creative, to rise to their highest level, to do their job, and to do the best they could do. And I never felt, you know, we've all had bosses at different times, and having somebody who allows you to do what you can do at the best level you can do it is the best thing you could ask for. And so I, I've always been grateful to him for really 10 of the best years I, I had working, and, uh, and I'm sure you have the same experience here. Um, it's also just great fun to be at a dinner that's just a celebration. <laughs> you know, there's not too many of them going on. Um, in, in a world of a lot of gossip and factionalism, not only out there in the world, I live like a mile from DC. My husband is a politico. Um, it's pretty bad there. Um, we also have in the church, of course, the sex abuse crisis right now. And with all of this, accompanied by 24-7 media, which often is self-referential. Do you notice how many media stories now are about a tweet on Twitter? Like, it's just, it's an endless, explosive, and factional cycle. But sometimes, like tonight, we just get to say thank you. We just get to celebrate. We just get to thank you and for being church and for building the church. I'm staying at the seminary. I'd, I'd actually like to live in the rooms that I'm there. I'm just going to speak to a few people about that. For helping to form people who are going to be uh, the next generation of Catholics, forming my kids, your kids, our grandkids. So I joined the bishop and the diocese in thanking an enormous number of people. I'm very impressed at the breadth of it. I think there's more donors here than to the Bernie campaign, right? <laughs> Just saying. All I know, all I know in DC is how many donors for, for one of the 20 candidates on the Democratic side. It's all we read about. But to thank all of you and to share with you my genuine affection and respect for the work of seminaries for the professors, for the staff, for the bishop who inspires them, for the rector, for the priests, the, the, the seminarians, the sisters, the lay people who are there. When I was getting my master's degree in systematic theology at Catholic University, I can tell you that I was, it was myself, one sister, another lay woman, and 24 seminarians. And I remember having come from Cornell Law School and then a very big law practice in Philadelphia that was pretty aggressive. And I remember looking around at the seminary and saying, where did they find like 27 nice people? Like, <laughs> I haven't been in a room with 27 really nice people in a long time. And, you know, where did they find guys that are so kind, so fun, so able to deal with the world as it is with a sense of humor? I remember when I entered, um, I was the only married person in the class. Um, and I didn't know anybody in DC. My husband was off working 24 seven. And I would sit on the edge of a hill at Catholic University with a little cup of yogurt. And it was a, a bunch of guys from um, the seminary across the street, theological college, who stopped me and were like, do you eat lunch alone on the hill every day like this with your little spoon? <laughs> yes. Um, would you like to come over and have lunch with us sometimes? And so I began to go a couple days a week and stay for mass in the middle of the day or at the five o'clock mass. And over time, we had parties together, 
We consoled one another over difficulties in school. We barely passed all our language exams together. <laughs> they gave me stiff spiritual advice when it was warranted. But above all, they made time for me like I mattered, like the community of Christ, the community that is the church, was a real thing. My experience with them gives me enormous hope that the way of the church, the, the method that Jesus used in order to pass our faith from generation to generation is in very good hands. And, and what is this method? And you'll notice tonight, I steal a lot from Luigi Giussani because I love reading his books. He's a, an Italian theologian who founded Communion and Liberation. Giussani refers to <clears throat> one of the methods of the church, Jesus's method, as setting up reliable witnesses whose love of Christ, whose ability to live a life in a way that reflected their love of him, ensures that Christ is not a memory of an insanely cool, smart, kind guy who lived 2,000 years ago, but rather the living God who died and resurrected and is actually with us still. So that when people look at people who are properly formed and who are vocationally charged with passing the faith on to the next generation, it's not just that they'll say, oh look, they said such intelligent or convincing things. They will say, look, it's possible to live this way. One of my favorite descriptions of Jasani's uh, description of Christ's method is in his book at the origin of the Christian claim. And he tries to get people to think about um, living the Christian life in a way that they can understand what we're doing, that we can say the reality of our everyday life and, and, and Christ alive and passing on the faith is not something obscure, too theological for us to understand, too mystical. It's actually the stuff of our daily life. And he uses as a method of explaining this, this passage from the Gospel of John. So the next day, John was there again with two of his disciples. And this is John the Baptist. And as he watched Jesus walk by, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard what he said and followed Jesus. Jesus turned and saw them following him and said, What are you looking for? They said to him, Rabbi, where are you staying? And he said to them, Come and you will see. So they went and they saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. It was about four in the afternoon. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two who heard John and followed Jesus. He found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah. Now, what does it take to be convinced that you found the one? Jasani reminds us that there, this gospel is being written after the Apostles have lived with Jesus over time and have seen him. And he analogizes it, and this works for me because I've known my husband for 40 years. I met him when I was 17, and we've been married for over 30. And when I go back and I tell our children the story of how I met him, Jasani says, you tell the story of how you met your love the way that John tells the story of meeting Jesus. And what is that? It's... <clears throat> It's telling a story a little bit out of order. You're just so excited. I'll say, oh, I met him. He was standing by the billboard. Oh, my gosh, he was wearing this crazy pair of jeans because it was like the late 70s, and he looked so stupid. And, <laughs> and then he said this and that, and then we sat and we had coffee, and it seemed like we could talk forever. And Yeah, I think it was about 6 o'clock. You, you tell a story in a way that indicates that you're struck by somebody. You tell a story in a way that after living with him for years, so, so it's a little out of order. They have that thing about it being four o'clock in the afternoon in the middle of, we met him, it's the Messiah, right? You tell it in a way that, that years later is born of coming to love this person and be unified with them forever. Well, my husband and I got in the car to, to go to our first child's graduation, and I looked at him, and I, I saw the 17-year-old when I met him, and we both, we just looked at each other to get in the car to drive to Chicago from D.C., and we started crying because we were both having the same thing, which was, how did I know that when I met you by the billboard in that stupid hall that day, we would be celebrating our first child's graduation from college together all these years later? Jasani analogizes the way the apostles were struck by Jesus and they're falling in love with him to the way a long married couples understand love. And what did they do? Living with him and seeing 
who is this genius and can take on the Pharisees and Sadducees and is also the man who cries with the widow who's lost her only son? Who is this humble and commands nature, just not ostentatiously at all, but with a very natural wave of the hand or, or a couple of words? Everybody else in the world who is that smart is arrogant. Everybody else in the world who is that powerful is mean or grasping. There is something here that is unique. He's the one. And now, if, and you, there's lots of Jasani on this that he talks about, other novels that exhibit this, but he says, so the Christian task is to be a person to whom others look and say, oh my gosh, I don't know how anybody lives like that, but I want to live like that. The world would be a better place if we lived like that, okay? This is the method of the church. This is the method of the priesthood. This is the method of formation of the laity, okay? It's very funny. I heard a speech by Christopher Hitchens. You know, he's the famous atheist who died not too long ago. And he said to his um, debate partner who was arguing for the existence of the Christian God, he said, yeah, right. So God comes into the world in an obscure corner of the Middle East, talks to like 12 guys and a couple of other people in a world with no communications technology, dies as a criminal hung on a tree, and that's supposed to be convincing to the world. And I thought, he doesn't get the joke, does he? It worked. <laughs> like, like, it actually spread everywhere. And how did it do it? Through a never-ending series of reliable witnesses to whom people could look and say, it's possible to live this way, and this is the way that I want to live. In other words, the kind of formation that happens in a seminary, in a school of theology, is one of the crucial ways of the church. Now, it can seem daunting today to think about forming people who can be seen as reliable witnesses. But just remember, don't fall prey to the, what they call the fallacy of the present, right? That things are always going to be the way they are now. Or the pessimistic fallacy of the present that says, oh my gosh, things are going to hell in a handbasket now and it's never been worse. Like, I have my best friend who still works at the Bishop's Conference, is a church historian, and she's like, oh yeah? And she's from Jersey, so that's exactly what she's, oh yeah? <laughs> You think it's bad now? She goes, what about when a bunch of popes had children scattered around Italy? She goes, what about 50 years of fighting about Arianism when people were like dragging bishops through the streets and beating them? And I'd like to add my personal favorite, what about clown masses in the 1980s? I mean, I lived through them every week in college. If you don't think the world is a better place now. Just as every generation of Christians has had their difficulties, Everyone has also had their communion of saints. Everyone has also had people who convinced others that it's possible to live this way. From the very beginning in the Acts of the Apostles, they talk about the apostles as, oh, those are those people over there in Simon's portico. Those are those people who were just arrested and brought before this or that local or Roman tribunal. And people were blown away by their confidence with the Holy Spirit and by their, the way they spoke about the risen Christ. In the early centuries, people were blown away by the fact that Christians invented the concept of hospitals and took in everybody, Christian or non-Christian. They were blown away by the fact that Christians would take up collections for other communities in faraway places. So yes, every generation has its difficulties, even extreme difficulties, but every generation also has its communion of saints. Now you'll say to me, and I say this to my husband all the time because he's a little bit more positive than I am, that today we have some unique challenges. <clears throat> we have what you might call the desacralization of society, the death of God, right? as if all that matters is material things. Maybe people care about their family and friends, but not the big questions or the big answers. Why were we created? Why do we suffer? Why do we hope? What do we owe one another? We also have today the explosion of scientism. If you cannot make an empirical, scientifically valid argument for something, then it's not worth talking about. And in fact, it's per se irrational. And so often, Christian is thrown on the heap of irrational ideas, right? You're not scientific. 
It's not worth knowing because you can't demonstrate it in an empirically verifiable, replicable way. We also have some really unique challenges to religious freedom. I mean, it used to be that everybody said they were for religious freedom. It's just that they had different ideas about what qualified. Now, uh, I mentioned this at the seminary this afternoon, in 2016, when the, uh, when the administration in DC issued its Civil Rights Commission report, it said that religious freedom was just code for bigotry. Okay, religious freedom is just bigotry. We also have a world where sexual license is taken to be the most important freedom that a human being could have, right? They're absolutely obsessed with it, as if that's all that people think about morning, noon, and night. I had a hysterical encounter when uh, John Paul II came to Denver for World Youth Day in 1983, I'm guessing. Uh, I was the bishop's press representative, and I went on a show that was then called This Week with David Brinkley, you may remember. Anyway, Sam Donaldson was one of the um, interviewers on the show, and I knew what I was in for. I mean, here we have John Paul II. The kids are going crazy for him. President Clinton was charmed by him. World Youth Day was this enormous success. And I'm about to go on, and I thought, let me throw Sam Donaldson off his game a little. And I said, hey, Sam, are we just going to talk about the sexy six? And he looked at me, and he's like, what? And I said, you know, celibacy, married priests, pedophilia, non-marital sex, contraception, abortion, new reproductive technologies. Is that what we're going to do this morning on this show, as if that's all the church is? I'm like, I just want to tell you, as a practicing Catholic, that we actually spend time doing things other than having illicit sex or talking about it. <laughs> it's like... We have whole minutes during the day when we're talking about other things, right? And I said, so I would really appreciate it if you would talk about some other things on the show about Catholicism. And he was thrown off his game. And when he raised the sex stuff and I went, well, you know, <laughs> you know that is not all that the church is or does. That's kind of the world's obsession. And so I know that's the only questions you want to ask me, but that's not what I'm going to answer. Like, so we're in a world that is obsessed with this. While we are one of the last institutions standing that still thinks it's not a good idea to separate sex, marriage, and parenting. We still have a celibate priesthood. We don't think sex is weightless, but we think rather that the idea that God put procreation at sex must mean that it matters in some particular way. We think that sex that has no relationship or doesn't even indicate or point toward tomorrow, toward family, kin, children, love, is probably going to do more harm than good. We also have the problem in the church that even in our own ranks, we struggle to help Catholics make the links between our teachings on sex, marriage, and parenthood and all the rest of the teachings of the Catholic Church, okay? People aren't really sure how it fits in. They often think it's a separate thing. There's all the good stuff the church is, and then there's the list of no's, okay? And the two shall never meet. So we suffer that even in our own church. And then on top of this, we have the sex abuse scandals. Well, yes, we could, if we were going to suffer the fallacy of the present, say that we're cooked, and that when Christ said that the church would not fall, that all the powers of hell would not bring it down, that that was probably true for a while, but maybe not so true anymore. But we also see that these kind of crises always have a silver lining, okay? Yeah, I don't know when you were growing up, but in the 1960s and 70s when I was growing up, we kind of took for granted that the 300 kids marching into church for First Communion or Confirmation, the, the movies that portrayed Catholicism favorably, the rise of Catholics in all kinds of areas of public life to prominence, was just our due and that it would continue. Maybe we thought that the authority of the church right, would carry a lot of weight people would at least follow the rules because they were common sense, and society also thought that these were smart rules for life. But all of that has gone away. Okay? We don't have that anymore. Instead, and Pope Francis recognizes this very well, we are in a situation now where if we don't ourselves, if we are not formed to understand that the most important thing at the center of our lives and the center of the universe is Christ, if we do not expose ourselves to well-formed people, 
I can't remember who, someone's gonna tell me who it is here in the audience, that you can't have the God as your father unless the church is your mother. Was that Origen or like Theodosius? I know one of you knows it. I know, I know the information is in this room. That if you cannot be Catholic alone, we have to have the encounter with Christ and the encounter with the community who has met him too. And we know that if we don't have that, that if we don't really encounter him daily in prayer, if we don't abandon ourselves, our things, our persons, our relationships to Christ, that we will be rule followers, we will be maybe morally correct, but we won't actually have the joy that is Christian. We won't be the kinds of witnesses who will convince anybody that it's desirable or possible to live this way. Good news, in many of the interviews I'm seeing of seminarians or young Catholics who are, or people who are, just came into the church as converts this Easter, you're seeing a lot of realization of the task that is ahead of us. There was an interview about uh, seminarians in um, the, the online Catholic website Crooks Now just this week. Um, and they interviewed this, um, a priest who would come back to his seminary to visit. And he said, when I came to the seminary in 95, I was a pretty good seminarian. I did what I was supposed to do. I got good grades. I was active in the community. And that pretty much got me through. But then he adds, today, these guys have to have a deeper, more personal prayer life, meditating on the Lord Jesus and on scripture more than I did. I think they're really committed to cultivating that in their life. They realize it's an absolute necessity. And in the same article, they interviewed another young seminarian who said, given where the church is now, people really need to see someone giving everything to the church, their whole life, because they believe in this and they're willing to do it, not just for the church itself, but for all her members. In that sense, he said, clearly aware of the irony of what he was about to say, this is a great time to be in the church, okay? And I, I think he's right. I resonate with that. It, certainly, the difficulties, the pressure, the, the disrespect has driven me back to Christ, driven me back to Mary, driven me back to the communion of saints, and to people who are clearly well-formed so that I can take joy in that community. There's no question that anybody seeking formation or leadership in the church today is not doing it for the prestige in society. But of course, realistically, I know it's a challenging time. I know in a desacralized world for you know, with ears only for arguments that sound in data or economic efficiency, in an individualistic world looking for its self-realization, often in some new notion of sexual identity, in this world, we need Catholic leaders who really offer people a glimpse of the living Christ. But they also have to have the intellectual dexterity to help overcome the world's idea that because we're not scientism, we are irrational. And they also have to help people at a very personal level to come to an awareness that these desires they have, all these longings for some self-realization in the world, are even deeper than they know. And they're actually a longing for infinite love. So they have to have personal gifts, intellectual gifts, and gifts of the spirit. What you're supporting is formation that takes years, a lot of expert people, a lot of loving people to do this um, for four to six years at a time. So as a mother, as an educator, as a fellow Catholic, I join my voice to that of the diocese to thank you so much for what you're doing, to tell you it's indispensable, it is the way of the church, and I thank you for all that you're doing. Good night. Thank you, Professor Alvare, for the inspiring talk. 
and for reminding us the fact that we are all in this together in a way in which the Lord calls us to witness to his love and his presence, his mercy, and that it is a unified mission to which we're called, and that we celebrate that here tonight. So while it is, in fact, the seminary that you support, that you generously have kept and sustained over these years and continue to do so into the future, it is also a time that each year we as faculty, priests, and seminarians, and those other administrators that are working there at the Athenaeum, that we celebrate being one with you in the mission to which the Lord has called us. And that is really the great gift of this evening in a way that I think is unique. There are many exciting things taking place in these coming years. One of which, which you're well aware of, is the fact that we are expanding. We are adding 30 new rooms, which is the Fenwick Hall building project, which will house not only more seminarians, but also will provide us the opportunity to do just what Professor Alvarez has suggested, deeper formation, continuing formation for both priest and laity throughout the summer to host various institutes. It's really going to be a game-changing addition to our facilities that are going to allow us to deepen and expand our impact in the years ahead. And we have you to thank for that. And so I want to thank you specifically this evening for supporting the Fenwick Hall project and for continuing to do so in the future. As part of that, I have the pleasure to introduce just a short video time lapse to show you how the building has progressed. So if we could go ahead. I think that's about as fast as it went up. <laughs> you might have noticed a lot of wet days in there. So even with 49 weather impacted days last year, we're still pretty much on schedule to be completed in time for the fall semester. So I'm going to ask you to, con to pray for good weather, right? <laughs> Not quite so much rain. We're about nine inches above average right now. Let's come back to average, right? <laughs> but like I said, we are anticipating having that and the courtyard completed late this summer, but in time for the fall semester. And I want to uh, extend a, a personal and special thanks to Mr. Dennis Egan, who has been the heading up of the, that project since its beginning and working diligently to keep it both on budget and on schedule. Thank you, Mr. Egan. And a final thank you for all of you here this evening. It is always a pleasure, as I said, and it is a great support and comfort to be assisted by your prayers, your presence, and of course, your financial gifts throughout the year that make this work possible. We don't do it, any of us, in order to be either recognized, but simply because the Lord has called and asked us, as he asked you, to give life into the world, his life. And as Professor Alvarez said, we celebrate that this evening, being called to that mission. I now ask Father Anthony Stevens, the Vice Rector, to come to the podium and lead us in our final prayer. Let us pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we thank you for this wonderful evening. Thank you in a special way for the gift of our Catholic faith. Thank you, for our, thank you for our family, our friends, especially our benefactors and all those who have made this work that we do at Mount St. Mary's School of Theology and Seminary possible. Thank you in a special way too for the call that you have given us, the call to live out our vocation. And we ask you tonight for the grace to be Christ's reliable witnesses in the world. Keep us safe as we go our separate ways this evening, and we give you honor and praise as we say together, glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Thank you, everyone. Good night. God bless, and enjoy the rest of your evening.